All righty. It, uh, it is a Sunday afternoon here in Cincinnati. Um, this is going to be, you're probably listening to this on Monday. Uh, we are about an hour, an hour after some pretty bad news. Eric, you are in New Orleans. Um, are you like at, in a hotel room by yourself? Or are you in, amongst a group of people that you've, I, I haven't really had any contact with people aside from the millions of texts that I've received. Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in an Airbnb. I, I actually probably have outstayed my welcome, but I think it'll be okay. <laughs> I think I, I'm pretty sure I just, uh, called the gal and was like, Hey, how much does it cost to stay for an extra hour? <laughs> um, but you know, the PFF forecast was born in a, in an airport. Um, but I didn't want to have to extend it out there. So yeah, man, such a shitty day of news, obviously. Um, you know, I know you, Lakers fan and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm, my heart grieves for everybody, including, um, you know, his family and all that stuff. It just sucks. Fuck. It really sucks. I, I am a, a big Lakers fan. I became a Lakers fan. The first game I remember watching was, um, Kobe dropping at 33 on Jordan, who was like the one NBA player I really knew about. And that's when I became a a Laker and a Kobe fan and obviously he's not a perfect dude I was never I, I don't think I was ever a Kobe stan thankfully um, but uh, there were obviously some some really redeeming factors about the guy and this just sucks he has four daughters it seems like some of his daughters were on the helicopter with him uh, which is even worse it doesn't appear his wife was um, man I I can't believe they're actually going to play the Pro Bowl. I can't believe that. Th yeah. I can't believe we're doing this podcast. Uh, I I ask you this because you're a historian of football and of sports in general. Um, it, I can't remember the last time there was this kind of shocking of a death slash news in the sports world, or honestly, yeah. like otherwise, in terms of shocking deaths. Well, you know. Um you know that uh, you know my basketball fandom uh, is like is lives through you, right? I ask you questions <laughs> about, but I will say when I was younger, I, I kept up a, a lot more on it, and I do remember where I was when Kobe scored what the eighty eight points or the eighty one points. Yeah. It, you know, I, I remember where I was when he did that. I, I can't believe how many. Like, I, it took me like a month in high school to score that many points, but Kobe's out here doing it. Like, <laughs> and then. Uh, and then I do in weird things like, yeah, as you said, Kobe's not perfect. I remember exactly, you know, when the, the scandal went, went down with him and, and, and how, you know, he, he worked to re reclaim his image. And, um, you know, he, he certainly, as you said, wasn't a perfect guy, but he, you know, you see him, he's really tried to elevate the women's game. He's, you know, really, you know, he's just, you know, he's, he seems like he's had a, a great retirement and things like that. So it really is tragic. And I don't know for football. I mean, it would be like something, I mean, it would be, it would be like Peyton Manning, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, like I agree. That's you know, a really good comparison, actually. He, he's not. He's somebody who just retired. We all, even young people, remember him playing. You know, and uh, you know, by all indications, he's had a good retirement and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like so. If you're a football fan, you can't really relate to basketball. It, it, it's as if something like that happened to Peyton Manning today. Yeah, I think that's a good comparison, especially because, um, you know, there were things. You know, their careers ended in ways that, you know, weren't perfect. Like, I remember being super frustrated that that Kobe didn't end his career trying to win championships as a facilitator and was so stubborn that he had to keep shooting. And, I, like, even when he scored 60 in his final game, I had chills watching that because I was like, how cool is this? Yeah. But also there was, like, a twinge of, ah, you know, like, you're just so stubborn. And uh, But I think that's kind of what made him – great right like you can't have the greatness that came before yeah. without that little bit of of stubbornness or a lot of stubbornness that persists and um i remember the scandal because he you know he, he was a guy that um you know i like i had posters on, on my room and everything and and like when the scandal happens it's super awkward because i was you know relatively young kid like having a discussion about what happened with like my mom and my dad like i remember it was an awkward time and I was like, I don't know, you know, so it was nice to see him really work hard to redeem himself. Obviously, you can't like make up for any of the things that have happened, um, you know, in the past in terms of like, you know, with your 
your fans and everything but like the comeback was pretty cool to see and uh it, by all accounts like his his uh, retirement was going to be awesome so i will apologize if i'm uh if i'm a little shooken uh, up but i'm going to power through uh well I'm, i mean here's the thing days like today remind us even folks like us who goof off about shit who i you know study a freaking game for a living right who have you know ultimately have i i would consider great lives um who can be hard on people and, and people are hard on us that today we're all human and you know and ultimately there's that one thing that unites us and that's life and it sucks when it's taken away from us so we have to be able to uh cherish it while we have it so um let's Let's talk some Super Bowl, okay? Let's, let's do it. I, I appreciate you saying that because I was having a, a kind of a, you know, shitty day. And then, like, all of a sudden this happens and everything goes away. You're like, the, yeah. you know, it's, it's crazy how sometimes, um, you know, things happen that totally reset your focus. So we'll reset our focus here and we'll talk um, some Super Bowl. And let's start with uh, some props because the props came out late last week and you got to be kind of quick with these right like i remember when we talked on sunday night last uh weekend and we looked at the spread and and the total and i went and immediately bet the total i think was was it 51 51 and a half and now it's 99 percent of the money is on the over and it's at 54 and a half and you know presumably only going higher so with props, there might be a little bit of latency, added latency to the props that don't necessarily align with where some of you know where the total might be moving that you might be able to take advantage of. And so we have an article out. You can go check it out on PFF.com and you can read all about them. We are going to talk a little bit about them here too. So let's let me start with this. If you have to bet one player prop in the entire game, what is it? Yeah, I think this ties in really nicely with what we're going to do later, which is basically five ga- ways the game can play out, right? Because the props, mm-hmm. you really have to sort of think about how the game's going to go uh, for how this ends up happening. And so for me, um, I think it's going to be a Dane. I think the, the to me, the, my favorite prop is Damian Williams under 64 and a half really? rushing yards. Um, because I think whatever happens in this game, I don't see the Chiefs blowing out the 49ers. And I don't see the I don't see the the Chiefs getting in a position where running the football is their best option on offense. Uh, and even if they do get ahead, I don't think it's going to be by enough for uh, you know the running game to be a really integral fact of it. And and lastly, and we, we're going to write about this this week, both of these defenses are way better at EPA allowed than they are at success rate allowed. Both are good at success rate allowed, but but where Damian Williams has generated the majority of his rushing yards, he has two runs a season, I believe over 80 yards, right? That's almost like, that's like a significant fraction of his yards. So the way in he gets here is a big play. I just don't see the Niners giving up big plays in the run game. Plus the, the chiefs have learned the hard way that no lead is safe right now. They've been on the Mm benefit, like they've been the benefactors of overcoming some big deficits, but they they probably realize as well as any team out there right now, and Andy Reid certainly realizes this that you know he cannot he cannot lay off. So there probably is no game state, as you said, where Damian Williams running the ball is something that's going to creep into their into their mindset. Plus, he's just not very good. The run blocking isn't great. Like they've been an abysmal running team this season. And to Andy yep. Andy Reid's credit, like they don't run the ball right. So. Yep. Um, I do like that one. Here's here's the one that I like the most, and that is uh, Jimmy G uh, passing yards. Depending on where you go, uh, I saw it on a website like 239 and a half, seen it 240 and a half. Um, but this is a reaction to the way that the Niners have won in the past two games in the playoffs. They've been able to run the ball to cement these, you know, like just thrashings of the Vikings and the Packers. The Chiefs are not the Vikings or the Packers. They have offense and a quarterback that are going to continue scoring points. So there's no doubt in my mind that the 49ers are going to have to throw the ball. And Jimmy G is not a bad quarterback. Since Emmanuel Sanders came over in that trade, he's been a top 10 graded quarterback. They have a top five offense uh, in the passing game and expected points added 
per pass play. And the maybe the best reason for why they'll go over 240 and a half is if the total is continuing to soar, if all these points are going to be scored, if they're playing Pat Mahomes, who's the best quarterback in the NFL, what do you expect the Niners to do? They're just going to run an outside zone with Raheem Mostert all game? I mean, come on. So give me the Jimmy G over. Yeah, and I think and, I, and another one that I like, and we didn't print out, we might have to wait until uh, our next article, but also like kind of derivatives thereof, right? Jimmy G over completions. Mm-hmm. I think it was 19 and a half really in the week. I, I bet on that a, a little bit. Um, but just even just thinking about like opportunities, right? So the Westgate published their totals on Thursday, which is a little bit after some of these offshores. And Jimmy G's at the Westgate was 246 and a half. Now you might not think that that's a lot, of a difference but like this is why props are easier to beat than normal markets because there's the even these like arbitrage opportunities uh that can be taken advantage of here which is why we posted some of them um with you know DraftKings, for example and then some of them at the west Gate, just because you know for example like sammy watkins i've seen differences of more than 10 yards in his receiving yardage total um and you know if you like his under for example obviously you want to take the highest number there and if you like his over you want to take the lowest number there um but yeah let's well hold on we're not going to get out of it you can't escape the prop market this quickly i know oh, there's can I, can I can i tell you a brief story that maybe will cheer us up a little bit sure um with respect to walk-ins so okay. um as you all know my wife bought a dog without asking me like three months ago everyone knows this everyone knows this we talked about it on the pod well we've with all the travel we've been doing and all the, and all the, uh, you know, my, my wife is, my wife has wanted a dog, you know, relatively, you know, it, it, the increase there has been palpable. And so I, I said a couple weeks ago, I said, look, you and you and the girls can have a dog, but it's everybody's birthday present this year. Oh, okay. So we agreed to get one. Um, they got one, uh, this week and I named it because, because it's the fifth most important individual in our family. Oh, wow. and I know it's this is prob- going. It's probably too expensive, but there might just be times when it comes up big for me. I named it. Oh Sammy. man, that's great. I didn't know where the hell you were going with that. Uh, that's perfect. So yep. basically, what you're saying about this dog is that two times a year, it's gonna have it's there's gonna be days where you take it for a walk, and it just brightens your day like nothing else, man. It's gonna be the most glorious day. You're gonna come home. You can have a nice cup of lemonade. Presumably, the, it's like one of the yeah. five times a year where the weather is decent in Cincinnati. You're like, man, I'm just so glad I have this dog. Um, yeah. I should mention, by the way, that uh, we are we are brought to you by our friends at uh, Thrive Fantasy. And basically, what you can do there is you can go play like a prop competition against your friends. You should go to. <laughs> this is the funniest. Uh, uh, what URL that I've ever seen? But you want to go to bit.ly slash thrive pff i'll say that one more time bit.ly slash thrive pff all right so we're gonna power on we're gonna go on to miami we're going to miami tomorrow or today when you're listening to this on a monday we're gonna be leaving monday night i'm pretty excited i have gotten i went and did some uh some pre-trip prop investment and we wrote a, a little article about it uh, on pff.com some early prop bets and the reason that you want to get on these early like think about the total right when we talked about it last sunday it was what 51 and a half and it's already 54 and a half and 99 percent of the money is on the over so like these will move quickly you don't want to be sitting there on saturday evening or sunday morning being like oh, i wonder if i should bet on this game right you want to bet on early so if you've got to make one prop bet right now one player prop right now what is it I think for me, it's Damian Williams under 64 and a half yards or wherever, you know, basically any, any, you know, any above 55 and a half, I think I'd like, um, for me, there are just not that many game States where the chiefs are going to become a running football team, right? Obviously any one where the Niners, uh, are ahead is not good. And Reed uh, has learned sort of from his mistakes here. So, um, I think that that's probably, uh, you know, even if they get ahead, they're probably not going to run the football. And um, when you look at the Chiefs from a, you know, how does Williams get his yards? He's had two really long touchdown runs this year. And, you know, as a pretty explosive guy, 
the Niners and the Chiefs are both teams that give up a decent amount of success rate on the ground, you know, till, still, de- you know, in the Niners case, decent, um, but expected points added are really low for the Niners as a, as a rushing defense. So I don't see Williams getting a big chunk play that he's probably going to need to go over this total. Plus you figure like Andy Reid's becoming more and more self-aware and they should also be very understanding of, even if they get out to a big lead, they've been on the other side of this, right? Where they have, they have come back on a couple of teams through the passing game, they're probably not going to sit on any lead, right? There's just no way that I could see Andy Reid talking himself into running the ball with Damian Williams when he has Pat Mahomes out there, which is one of the reasons that if I had to bet one prop, the over Jimmy G props, so either over passing yards or over completions, I think passing yards is around the 240, 240 and a half range, and completions is under 20, like 19 and a half. And to me, there are two big factors here. The first is, Everyone is looking at how the Niners have won their past two games, right? So they've destroyed both the Vikings and the Packers. But the way that they've beat them is they've gotten out to these big leads. And those teams' offenses have been totally, like, they've been floundering. It's been pathetic to watch both of those opposing offenses. So they were able to just run the ball and salt away the game. But in this game, even if they get out to a 21, 24 nothing lead, like we've seen this happen before, right? So there's really no lead that's safe. And I, I don't expect the Niners to get out to that big lead. So I, I, I anticipate them trying to throw to win, to get a lead, but also having to throw to sustain that lead throughout the game. Yeah, I mean, here's the other thing. In the games against the Niners, or sorry, against the Vikings and the Packers, Jimmy G's inability to avoid turnover-worthy plays caused the Niners to run the football. In a game against Kansas City, the more turnover-worthy plays Jimmy G produces, the more he's going to have to throw the football because those those are going to cause the you know 49ers to get behind, and they're not going to come back with the run game. So um, that that's a sort of another way to look at it. I, I, I love that. Uh, we've talked about it over and over again over the past week. So, uh, those are great. We disagree though, about whether they started running because Jimmy G was not looking good. See, I think they, they started running the ball in the Vikings game because the Vikings look like a pop Warner team. In fact, uh, the pop Warner team in my, my area growing up were called the Vikings. They, they looked very reminiscent of that group. And then against the Packers, um, similarly, it just like, there was no need to even try throwing the ball because the Packers had never played run. It looked like they'd never played run defense before. So I anticipate that Kyle Shanahan has full confidence in Jimmy G. I think that might be another reason people are skeptical. They're like, well, he's lost confidence in Jimmy G. It's like, look, you're in the Super Bowl. You're not going to be scared of your quarterback and just, you know, punt on your quarterback playing, um, playing this, this huge game for you. So um, I have full confidence in Jimmy G. Kyle Shanahan has full confidence in Jimmy G. Even you, Eric, should have full confidence in Jimmy G. Uh, I'm less bullish on him than you are, but yeah, yeah I, that's fine. Let's do uh, let's do two more. But before we do, uh, we are brought to you by uh, Thrive Fantasy. They have a cool little uh, web app that you go check out at bit.ly slash Thrive PFF. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Thrive PFF. Basically, it's like a prop competition against your friends. So you can log on there and, you know, you and I, if we disagreed on Jimmy G, we could... Uh, We could bet on his prop and you could take the under, I take the over, whatever it is, but you should go check it out. All right. Second prop. You have to take one more. What is it? Uh, I found Sammy Watkins under four and a half catches to be just absolutely divine. And, uh, this, this, you don't have, you you don't have a story about this, do you? (laughs) Well, uh, I think I delivered it decently in the first take of this so it's going to be hopefully i can do it the second time uh (laughs) now that you know it's coming we were into we were for people that are listening to this we were rudely interrupted and we had to cut and redo this segment so here you go i mean it's it's 95 percent my fault but yes um so the (laughs) you know as as people know on the pod on the pod we my my wife bought a dog without telling me and so we flipped the dog for some money uh mid-season uh, could be why we we struggled on picks in the last like five weeks of the year. You never know the, the karma. karma. Yeah. yeah. Um, but over the past like few months, uh, you know, we, we decided that we were actually going to get a dog, but just, we were all going to be, uh, consenting about it. And, uh, so last week I was like, well, what are you going to get? And she goes, you know, 
I was going to golden retrieve. I still have a method thing. It's at our house now. It was, they got it when I was in New Orleans. And I said, okay, my only stipulation is that you name it Sammy. Um, of course, after Chiefs wide receiver Sammy Watkins, who, you know, this dog is going to be the fifth most important uh, thing in our family. Um, I, I think it's probably overpriced. Oh, man. And, uh, you know, but at the same time, if I like ever like, you know, for example, eat too much Chinese food and eat a walk, it'll be like a great companion, right? It'll come up big at times. Like yeah. it's never there when you need it. Right. Right. But it's sometimes there. Yeah. I mean, you're going to eat overeat Chinese food at least twice this upcoming year. And you're going to be like, man, I'm just, this day is I just need a walk. because of, because of Sammy, my dog. And then the rest of the year, it's going to be just pooping on the floor and you're like man i don't know why we spent so much money so that i could pick up poop off of my floor so with that being said i assume that sammy watkins is not is not someone that you think is going to be competing for mvp of this game and you're taking his unders yeah i think and it depends upon where you get it i thought i saw some uh, a place that had his number in the 40s but we at the westgate i saw it it was 67 and a half, which is ridiculous. I like under four and a half receptions more though, which is minus 120, just because, you know, Watkins simply, he hasn't gotten more than four and a half targets more than twice in the last like two months, right? So even to get the opportunity to catch that ball, like he can have a game like he had against Houston where he goes two for 76 or something crazy like that. But, um, you know, ultimately speaking, like that's, um, you know, that's, that's not really something he's going to do. Um, I would also mention, I would also mention this. I think the Niners coverage unit is not getting nearly enough love for like how the Niners have done the season, how the defense has improved. Everyone assumes it's just all because of the pass rush, but that coverage unit went from basically worst to first. Uh, this past year, we talked about that last week. And Sammy Watkins is not the guy, just like your dog, that I would expect to go above and beyond the call of duty to make plays in a situation where it's harder to do so. I wrote an article, I think it'll come up tomorrow, about the, the most impactful draft picks for both teams over the, you know, the eras that these people have been in charge. And Emmanuel Mosley was not drafted by the Niners, but ultimately taking him as an undrafted player last season is one of the most important things that they've done. And that that defense doesn't have a, a weakness. Um, and if it, and if they did, Andy Reid's going to find it with Hill and Kelsey, not Watkins. Um, and, and Sherman doesn't move around or the field very well. Yeah, yeah, but you know Sherman doesn't move around the field, so there might be a decent amount of game where like they just sacrifice Watkins on him on that right side of the offense. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's all tons of reasons where like you know this is not a t you know a great you know if you're if you like the overs, find another receiver. I'm with you. Speaking of overs, I'm continuing to, to hammer the over. And the reason for that is, like, I bet the over in this game last Sunday. It's since gone up by three points. Where can I find some value on, hey, the, I think there's going to be a lot of points scored in this game. Well, I can't go really bet the total anymore because, I like, that number is just shooting up. So one of the places that I would look is Kyle Juszczyk. Ten and a half receiving yards. You're telling me that Kyle Shanahan <laughs> doesn't have five plays for Kyle. like I'd be shocked if you get through the first drive, the first Niners drive, and Kyle Uzcheck doesn't have a 15 yard catch. I watched, you know, I've gone back and watched a bunch of 49ers games, and Kyle Uzcheck is just someone that they leverage in big in big moments and in situations where they, you know, they don't need to leverage him every game obviously, because in some games they're, you know, they're blowing other teams out. But when they need to, Kyle Juszczyk is a huge part of their passing game. And that's one of the things that the Niners do really well. They're able to keep Juszczyk on the field uh, and use him as a, you know, kind of a decoy, right? Because he's a great run blocker. They obviously run the ball a lot and teams are expecting the run quite a bit, but he can also catch the ball. Um, so I, I, Kyle Juszczyk getting a 15-yard reception feels like it's just, it's just already, it's preordained in the stars. And the Chiefs... He had a 35-yard touchdown the last time they played. Um, as much as the Chiefs have improved defensively, Anthony Hitchens is still a below-replacement-level player. Um, you know, a great deal of the... I think a great deal of the attention will be going to Kittle and Debo Samuel, uh, rightfully so. So use check catching one. Making one, you know, big play in this game, to me, is, is positive EV. Yeah, I'm with you there.
Okay, so you can go check out our article on pff.com. We'll have another one coming out this week. We'll be monitoring. We'll find some good nuggets in Miami, like who, which player escapes the the compound to go out for a night on South Beach, and therefore we. Who's going to gonna be at the strip club with a New Balance sweatshirt on? <laughs> Man, that was so funny. The funniest part about that Kawhi strip it's called class warfare on your part. <laughs> the funniest part about that Kawhi strip club moment isn't even that he's wearing a New Balance sweatshirt. It's how awkward he is in the strip. Uh, I can't. I'm not going to describe it for people, but you can go check it out and see what I see what I mean by that. Um, all right, so let's move on from some props. Before we do, I should mention um, that. We're going to Miami, and uh, I was trying to figure out what shirts to bring. Packing is a thing. And uh, I realized that I have struggled for a very long time with finding, like, decent collared shirts. And so I was packing up the collared shirts that I have. And I was like, oh, these are all my proper cloth shirts. Because the only dress shirts that, that I can get now that fit me are proper cloth shirts. And the reason is that they custom fit them for you. So you answer 10 easy questions. And it uses a machine learning algorithm and fits your own custom size that's just for you. Go to propcloth.com, answer those 10 easy questions, then you can customize the shirt, 30 different style points that you can tinker with. You can make the left cuff bigger if you want, the bright pocket bigger if you want, whatever it is. You have some weird tick about your shirts, proper cloth has got you covered. The fabric is awesome. I would not wear a shirt that does not have great fabric. They go to the best fabric producers from around the world get that fabric and then allow you to use any fabric that they have in your custom shirt uh, gq even called them their new favorite online custom shirt maker they've been featured in new york times wall street journal esquire fast company the list goes on and on go to propercloth.com slash pff and then enter code P enter code the uh, gift code pff20 and you can save 20 dollars on your first shirt all righty moving onward what do you want to talk about next? Should we do the uh, the f the coaching battle here? Well, yeah, I mean, because I think, don't you think right now that Kyle Shanahan, and rightfully so, is getting a, a great deal um, of love as a as a coach? Like we saw that the we saw the thing where he was talking to the official right before one of the Green Bay Packers players mugged George Kittle and yeah. all the Packers. The Cheesehead TV got pissed for no reason and like all this kind of stuff and. Obviously, there's there's you know you'll push back on this, but there's the the idea um, that you know uh, Jimmy Garoppolo is weak and and he's really propping him up and all this kind of. But when I look into this and I you know, wrote an article, I think it'll go on the site to tomorrow or uh, you know Monday or um, and about Andy Reid and like all the all the great things that you know as a Kansas City Chiefs coach. Uh, he's done. So I do think it, has there been a, a more premier matchup between two coaches in a Super Bowl in, you know, in a lot. I mean, because I, I know McVay versus Belichick was great last year, but I think this one exceeds it. Oh, definitely. And the the uncovered well, actually, it wasn't uncovered, but the kind of dirty little secret about that game last year was that the Rams offense had been exposed well before that game. Right. Like the Bears you know, came out and put, they basically widened that front and basically said, hey, you're not going to run your outside zone against us. And we're just going to assume that if you're giving us a play fake, it's going to be a pass and we're going to, you know, mess that up right from the get go. So uh, to me, the Rams offense had sputtered long before that game. And in this situation, you've got, it's not an offense versus defense thing. It's an offense versus offense. And that's what's so beautiful about it is you've got two teams that are just going to have to keep scoring, right? It's almost like a game of horse between, uh, you know, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, like both of these guys are going to make some incredible shots. They're going to have some play designs that you're going to be like, wow, I, you know, this is just awesome. Like, I'm so excited to watch this. They have two weeks to prepare for it. And what will be really interesting to me is which coach. So you talked about the underdog thing. Both these coaches have some demons to, to bury, right? Like Andy Reid has got the late in game stuff. And Kyle Shanahan has the, hey, remember that last time you were in the Super Bowl thing? <laughs> so the way that those two things manifest themselves, I think is going to be very interesting. So I, here's the first thing that I'm looking for. What, what happens on fourth and short? We talked about it with Andy Reid last week, right? Mike Vrabel goes for a fourth and two, gets it, scores a touchdown. Very next drive, Andy Reid has a fourth and two. And I believe because Mike Vrabel went for it, he had to go for it. And so he goes for it as he should have. He has a great offense. They capitalize. 
Kyle Shanahan has shown a propensity to be kind of risk averse, very much a punt or kick a field goal guy, except in games where he's the underdog in Baltimore, in New Orleans. He was very willing to go for fourth and shorts. And yeah. the fact that they, there is this underdog narrative helps him, I believe, in this situation. And if he gets the first opportunity, I think he's going to go for it, which then I think in turn will help, you know, big old Andy Reid over there push the button and say, hey, I'm actually not going to be conservative here. But I'm curious, do you think there's one team that has an advantage on in those situations? Because I think there is. So I, I'm curious, what do you think? Fourth, fourth and shorts, who would win that battle? You got five shots each. Like, which team's coming out on top? I think the Niners. I think the Niners are far more of, uh, you know, I Garoppolo is not as as accurate as Mahomes is, um, but the that offense is does prefer the underneath passes and the runs. The Chiefs, if you tell me, okay, line up in twenty two personnel and get a yard uh, on the ground, I, I the Chiefs are no better than the average team in the NFL, probably even worse, right? So uh, I think in the short yarded situations, the Niners are certainly. Uh, in better form than than the Chiefs are. Yeah, it's weird. I, I I totally agree with you. I'm to me, this is where the Niners like smash mouth running game actually does matter, and the fact that the Chiefs and Damian Williams are just an atrocity as a run team. If you have say there are four big fourth down and shorts in this game, you know the Niners. I feel much better about them. You know having six run plays that they can leverage, including some good quarterback sneak stuff. I mean, obviously, the Chiefs have run a few quarterback sneaks, one of which didn't turn out very well for them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not that I'm not – I don't have faith in Mahomes doing that. It's just that I, th the Niners, to me, that's one of the places they do have an advantage. Yeah. The, the place where I think offensively they have a distinct disadvantage is, you know, they have a lot of really good weapons, but, like – Andy Reid has got to be sitting there with two weeks to to prep for this. He's got Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Miko Hardman, Pat Mahomes. The offensive line is playing really freaking well. Like from a just overall general game plan standpoint, that's where Andy Reid, I think, can separate himself a little bit from Kyle Shanahan. Yeah, there's no statistical basis for this just because of the way that the Chiefs have played this year. But, you know, I do think if you want to look at like over under yardage props for Tyreek Hill as a runner, I think it's like five and a half. Um, and the Chiefs are really laid off of that because of his injuries this year. But there is a chance, like, if I'm if I'm the Chiefs, I'd rather have Hill carry the football uh, in a third and short situation than I would Damian Williams in some degree. Now they have, you know, statistically, it's those, those tap passes that aren't really, uh, you know, ac they're actually passing plays. But, like, that's another way to look because I agree with you. I think the Chiefs, you know, they've held back this entire year of being a really creative run team. Maybe we'll see that in the Super Bowl with the two weeks off. If you had to take, if you have one coach, you know, that you get two weeks to, to scheme up a game plan and then, and then actually also call yeah. the game, would you rather have Shanahan or Reed? No, I, you know, I like Shanahan a lot. And, and obviously this is, I'm going to get labeled a homer here, but Andy Reed, you know, his track record with a buy, his track record, you know, in general is just to me, uh, something that, uh, I'll go with here. Obviously, you know, Shanahan is somebody that you have to respect a lot, and he's close. But to me, it's Reed, you know, just with those two weeks off. I I would go with Kyle Shanahan, and here's for, like, kind of the exact same reason that you would go with Andy Reed, which is the fact that he is so much younger, he has, I think he has less to lose here. I think he's going to play with less pressure. I think there is so much of a, you guys are the underdog narrative, and he's got, you know, 20, 30 more years. So he's... To me, this is going to be the freest that he is going to to coach one of these games. He's already had one where he was the offensive coordinator. This team is a much, you know, the Falcons were the Falcons still then, right? And and have been for three years afterwards. We know all the kind of issues that they have. This is not the Falcons team. So I think Kyle Shanahan will be more willing to go for it on a fourth and short. I think he's going to have a tremendous game plan. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can't lose with either one, but. It's nice that both of us took uh, <laughs> took the guy took that, our favorite team. That, uh, I, I do favorite. agree with you uh, with the narrative that this game is this game this game the Chiefs. If everything we say is true, the Chiefs are a more tense team in this one. That they are they're they're a team that should like this is you know the Niners are a surprising team this year. Um, 
but it, it is weird. We talked about this as well. It's like, but the Niners also might not be back given some of the, you know, whereas, you know, given their, their issues at quarterback relative to the chiefs, it's a really interesting thing about like who, which team is going to be more tense for this game. Yeah. I, I mean, you got, you caught some flack for saying that it, it is very interesting though, because the chiefs do have some question marks at quarterback too. Not, not because Mahomes isn't great, but like they haven't signed him yet. You yes. know? So when they do sign him, if they sign him this enormous deal and it ends up hurting the rest of their team, you know, I mean, how many times have, have we seen this in sports where a, a great player is hamstrung by the fact that he gets literally no help? And I think Mahomes is as close to a invincible player as there, there is in the NFL right now. But, you know, there are definitely question marks on both sides. All right, let's do this. We're going to do two things uh, to close out the pot. We're going to do the five most important players for each team, and then we're going to run through the five ways that this game could play out. So let's do five most important Chiefs players. Who do you think is the most important Chiefs player? Well, it's obviously Mahomes. Probably don't have to go over that very, very much. You think so? Yeah. Really? (laughs) I was going to go with Harrison Butker, but... Okay. All right. I mean, do you have any, like, are you worried at all that Mahomes isn't going to be great in this game? No. See, that I'm not. And that's why I actually, I don't know if I'd make him the most important player for this team because his floor is still good enough for them to win this game. Yeah. So the Delta, the Delta is not something like the Delta isn't the highest for sure. Yeah. I, so I yeah. don't know that that's the one I'd kind of waver a little bit. I think there's a guy that you can look for and maybe this is your number, your number two, but um, just the offensive line in general. And I know that's kind of cheating, but the pass protection for the chiefs can't be abysmal. Like they can't just poop themselves in this game. That's like the one way where things could fall apart. You just continue. They're able to get like, you know, 10 or 12 hits on Mahomes and They're just continually getting quick pressure. If they can just be their average selves, then they obviously have a great shot to win this game. So to me, the second most important is that offensive line. Mitchell Schwartz has been great, but that that whole unit needs to at least play decently. Yeah, I agree. I think the third most important player in this game for the Chiefs is Tyron Matthew um, because you can make an argument that George Kittle is the most important player for the 49ers. And whether the Chiefs try a, a committee approach to, to to go after Kittle or they try Matthew, Matthew's going to be a humongous, um, you know, player for them in terms of trying to stop uh, what is the, the the Niners like best threat on offense. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually I think you could have gone with we could have gone with Matthew easily as like one or two. If they, I mean, they're they've got to put him on Kittle. I, I feel like they just have to. It'll be interesting to see though if they do, and all of a sudden the other guys can't really hold up. Whether they stick with it and let them say, okay, yeah. look, we've committed to, you know, we're not going to let George Kittle beat us, or if they, you know, if they switch things up, say at halftime, if Debo Samuel and Emmanuel Sanders are are beating the other guys outside and in the slot. Um, fourth most important guy for the Chiefs to me is uh, your buddy Tyreek Hill. And the reason that he's so important is not, is not surprising, but there is a lot of variance. I think with Tyreek Hill, he's yep. gotten nicked up a lot this year. And that's, that's the one thing that's kind of their, their ace in the hole, right? Is the Niners. Yeah. Their defense is very talented, but if there's one place where you feel good about attacking the Niners, it's over the top. And if you have both Hill and Miko Hardman on the field, to me, that's just a huge advantage, right? There's no one on that Niners defense that's running with both those guys, much less one of them. So Tyreek Hill being able to just stay on the field is massively important. Yeah, and if you you look at the game against Houston, they took away Hill over the top, but Kelsey did great work in the 10 to 19 range. And then the Titans specifically took, took away the 10 through 19 range. And Mahomes is great over the top and great underneath. And, and a lot of that is is uh, is Hill running those underneath routes and making plays after the catch. Um, so I, I'm I'm in agreement with you there. Uh, and I think lastly, and this, you know, we're very much on the, and I wrote an article about this this week, very much on the coverage over pass rush thing. Um, but to me, I also think Frank Clark is a pretty important player for the Chiefs this week. Um, and 
Niners are terrific at tackle uh, relative to where they are on the interior. But the Chiefs, you know, aside from Chris Jones, who's pretty banged up and probably will only play uh, on pass downs, um, you know, they don't, he's the one guy that they trust to get pressure, uh, you know, and, and the Chiefs have done a great job of getting quarterbacks to go to their second read. Jimmy G is not a second read guy um, statistically. So uh, if, if, you know, if Frank Clark slash that secondary can get Jimmy G a little bit uncomfortable, I think it really does help the, uh, the, the Chiefs defense. So go, give me Clark. It's also important that he doesn't line up offsides. I, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Seattle. That Seattle, like, uh, uh, that Seattle tree is, is kind of the woat. Yeah, it's pretty funny. All right, five most important guys for the Niners. I'll go first here. Um, see, to me, this is, this is the side of the, this is the team where it's very clear that the most important guy is the quarterback. And the reason for, that Jimmy G, Jimmy G is the most important player in this game because the variance for Jimmy G is so much wider. We talked about this with Mahomes a bunch. Mahomes is not only the best player in the NFL, but he's the most consistent, which is one of the reasons that he's the best. It, I mean, he, he missed like two total passes in that last game against the Titans. He was yeah. so good in the short and intermediate areas that it didn't matter that they didn't hit a ton of big plays. They didn't hit a big play until, until close to the end of the game with that Sammy Watkins pass. Mahomes is so good that if Jimmy G is not above average, the Niners cannot win this game. So Jimmy G is the most important player for the Niners. That's a pretty good one. Um, and yeah, I mean, that it's, it is. I mean, is there a path where Jimmy G plays horribly and the Niners win? No. I don't think so. No. Um, okay, let's look. For me, the second guy is Kittle, right? Because if Jimmy G plays averagely, does, do the Niners win? Maybe if Kittle does a lot, you know, if Kittle does what he has to do underneath and you look at Samuel, you look at Kittle, both of those guys have been able to take advantage uh, of the Niners low a dot offense because they make plays after the ball is in their hands. Um, but Kittle is, you know, chief among them. The, he, the chiefs are going to put their strongest player on him, I think. And he has to win and he has to win uh, frequently. I think given, um, you know, how much they're going to have to score. So to me, the, the third most important is it easily could be Richard Sherman. But I, I, Richard Sherman, I have great faith in. He does, just doesn't get beat deep. I, I mean, maybe they get you know, one or two shots you know, at him. But I, I have good faith in Richard Sherman. You mentioned Emmanuel Mosley earlier, Quan Williams. Both of those guys have played really well. Akella Witherspoon has had his ups and downs. But those, those are the guys that are number three on this list. Because the Chiefs have so many offensive weapons that they're going to stress those guys in coverage. And I spoke about how improved the Niners' coverage has been. If you look at just quick throws, passes in 2.5 seconds or less, the Niners had the 31st ranked coverage unit using PFF grade last year. It's second this year. So, I mean, they have just been so dramatically better in coverage, but it's volatile. And if those guys don't, if those guys aren't prepared, if they don't have a good game, if Andy Reid compromises them and they're not able to step up, it's bad news for the Niners. Yeah, that's a really good one um, for sure. I think uh, kind of drifting in this direction, I think Quan Williams probably is is with him as well, right? I mean, so if you go Mosley and, Mosley and Williams at three and four, mm -hmm. uh, could you go wrong? No, I, I don't. And, and the, the Chiefs do such a good job of attacking from the slot, right? Both yep. with Kelsey and... And with their receivers, it, it, it's going to be the biggest challenge that Quan Williams has faced. No doubt about it. Yeah. And Williams has had a good year. He's had, you know, a good career for the Niners, most mostly. Um, but again, as you said, coverage is volatile. I, as a Chiefs fan, I feel every bit as worried about the fact that, you know, we've write, written up about how good they've played in coverage this season. And just thinking to myself, well, if Kyle Shanahan knows that he's going to find a way, uh, I think if you're a 49ers fan, you have to sort of think the same way. Fifth most important player, uh, this one to me is pretty easy, Emmanuel Sanders. He is such a talented wide receiver. He has 
some of the best hands in the NFL. There's only a handful of guys that have as many targets. I think it's over a thousand targets and less than 30 drops or something like that. There's like five guys in that list. Um, he's been so darn good despite having bad quarterback play. They haven't had to throw the ball a lot in either of their two playoff games. He is going to get targets in this game. I, I believe they're going to allow him to make some plays. And if he does, it could be huge for this team because they're going to give uh, the Chiefs are going to give a lot of attention to George Kittle. So the person, you know, who's going to step up? Debo Samuel's a rookie. He's been tremendous. I think he's getting a lot more publicity, right? His yardage total is higher than that of Sanders, which if you had said that five weeks ago, I would have laughed at. Um, so to me, Emmanuel Sanders is a guy who I think a lot of people are sleeping on who is going to be important in this game. Any qualms yeah. about that? No, that's a good one. I think Samuel is going to be important as well, but yeah. um, Sanders is the guy that I think has the biggest. I think Samuel has gotten basically three to five targets every single game since week 10. He's gotten one or two carries. Like, I think like his volume and his efficiency is going to be about as known as known. Um, but, you know, if the Chiefs do a good job and shut out Sanders or Sanders uh, and Garoppolo are not on the same page, I see a hard I, I have a hard time seeing the, the, the Niners winning the game. All right, we're going to do the five ways that we think this game will play out. Before we do, I want to remind you guys to come hashtag prop up on Thrive Fantasy for the big game. Thrive Fantasy is a daily fantasy sports app for player props. They have eliminated the need to do countless hours of research because they only ask you about the top tier athletes in a respective sport. Choose 10 out of the 20 player prop options to build your lineup. Each prop has a fantasy point total associated with the over or under based on its likelihood to occur. The more points the selection is worth, the riskier it is. Rack up the most points to win a share of the prize pool. Thrive has over $20,000 guaranteed for the big game between the 49ers and the Chiefs and a $500 free roll. Use promo code PFF to sign up today and you will receive an instant match up to $25 on your first deposit. Download Thrive Fantasy on the App Store or Play Store or by visiting their website, www.thrive.com. T H R I V E fantasy.com sign up and hashtag prop up today. All right. The five ways that you foresee this game playing out. So let's do this in order of likelihood. You want to go okay. first or should I? All right. Let's yeah, I'll go first. Okay. I think the the most likely way that this game go turns out is, is very 49 or saints like. Mm. So just a Close game, back and forth. No team gets bigger than a two-touchdown lead. Uh, game goes over the total relatively easily, and it comes down to which team basically has the football last. That 49ers Saints game was a game that I rewatched a couple times, and the very interesting thing about that game was the Niners came out and threw the ball really well on that first drive, score quickly, but then end up getting in a in a hole. Right, they're down 21-7. And they're able to claw back into that game because of how efficient their passing offense is. So to me, I, I think that's a great call. What's interesting about the Saints offense is in that game, they got the ball out of Drew Brees' hands in, instantly. Like he snapped the ball and it was out of his hands. And the Saints have a really good offense. But the difference between the Saints and the Chiefs offense is that the Chiefs players are more, you're way more scared of the Chiefs in a quick passing game situation than you are the saints. Right. And I think that's yep. ultimately the difference. Yeah. The thing that the saints did in that game that they didn't do a ton this year, they did against Tennessee as well, but they they weren't consistently good at this was make big plays. Yeah. Um, and the chiefs are a big play offense. Um, and the Niners to their credit in that game, you saw Emmanuel Sanders threw a touchdown pass. I believe Jimmy, you know, you had the, you had the Kittle run at the end of the game, but, um, so this, I, I think they could jab at each other pretty quickly, you know, you know, pretty early and often in this game. And, and then it comes down to who turns the ball over the most and who has the ball last. So in that case, you're betting the over and all of the props we talked about for the Niners hit. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I would like a different result at the end, but I think the second way that this game plays out is very similar to how the Chiefs have just played this whole this whole playoff run. And to me, the Chiefs are going to come out relaxed because they are so confident in Pat Mahomes. And the Niners are going to come out juiced. I mean, they're, they have so many emotional players. You know, they've got Sherman. Bosa's super emotional. I think Jimmy G and Kyle Shanahan are both actually pretty emotional guys. And they come out and, and they just get out to a big lead 
and then they start running the ball. And this is what worries me is that this year, the Niners, when they have had a lead, have run the ball just a ton. And I know that a lot of that is a function of playing bad teams and beating up on them. My worry is that they don't understand that and they'll believe, oh, this is just what we do, right? We're going to salt this game away with the run game. Um, they're going to run the ball. It's going to at first have some success, but I think ultimately it, it gets close at the end. And the fact that Jimmy G hasn't had to throw a pass in three quarters comes back to, to bite him in the butt and, uh, and the Chiefs make another historic comeback and win by, you know, four or five. Yeah, and that that one's tough. That would be tough for a Niners fan because you know the Chiefs. I think a Chiefs fan would go through that game and think to themselves, you know, me. I was always concerned about whether they'd be able to get the stops against Houston and Tennessee, um, but it, but ultimately there's that limitation in playing. You know what what somebody you know deemed the the prevent offense, right? Uh, and you know every team that's had effective running streaks like Tennessee. Oh no, Tennessee's different. Well, no, actually there weren't. And you know you look at how the Niners played against the. Vikings and the Packers and you say okay the Niners are different well maybe they're not likely in all likelihood they're not right and what and so yeah go ahead. and so that to me is like if you're a Niners fan that is a worrisome outcome right it, you almost now this sounds really stupid but you almost hope in some sense that the Chiefs are game right away right so that so that the the Niners know that they're in a fight to the finish from the beginning if they go out slow like a three and out in the first drive or fumble a punt or something um, you know, even if you do take advantage, you got to know that this, this game's not over. That's crazy that you said that. Cause as I was going through this scenario, I thought to myself, is it better for the Niners that they don't get out to a big lead? If they have, you know, if they get out the gates a little bit slow and it forces them to have a like settle down moment where they say, okay, we're fine. Like we'll get this, you know, slowly, but surely Kyle Shanahan is then willing to go for it on some fourth downs. Like, I just have this terrible vision of, you know, what is it? Say 20, you know, 28, 14 chiefs yeah. scored twice. The Niners have a fourth and one at the 50. We get a shank punch. punt and yeah. then all of a sudden it's 21, 28 and chiefs nation is like, you know, just singing pit bull songs until, um, <laughs> you know, until their lungs get out. Uh, yeah. right. third most likely way. What's another way that this, uh, I think this might play out. Uh, man, I, it's tough, right? Cause you think, to, you know, there, there's obviously the chiefs blowing out the, the Niners. And I don't, when I say blowing out, I don't mean 30, 35, seven. I mean, kind of like how, yeah, I would say something more along the lines of like 30, you know, 34, 20 or something like that. Something where. You know, the Niners aren't embarrassing, um, but they're not close the whole time. Chiefs are sort of in control. I'm sitting here frantically tweeting at Andy Reid saying, locate the throat, Andy. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't quite do it. You know, he doesn't quite make it 51-20, but I'm not, like, shitting myself in the fourth quarter hoping that they, you know, that, you know, it's just one of those games where the Chiefs have controlled the whole time, but it's not like a laugher. Well, that's what we saw last year. We rewatched that game from last year when these two teams met, and the Chiefs scored on five, touchdowns on five straight possessions. They're certainly capable of that. the The thing is, it's going to be a little harder against a defense that is not, you know, that isn't blowing coverages, that doesn't have guys that are getting mm -hmm. torched, kind of left and right. To me, that that outcome happening is as much about the Chiefs' offense as it is the Niners offense right and like you know Jimmy G has had some issues throwing the ball to linebackers go check out Sam uh, Monson's article about it but if that I've talked about this a couple of times if that throw comes at the wrong time then the, the Niners can be in a really big hole really quickly and you have to be so perfect to get out of that and come back against the team that is trying to continually score points that I do think this is the third most likely outcome. I think it's far more likely than a Niners, uh, you know, victory by 20 points. Because for the Niners to do that, they not only have to play lights out on offense, which is a little less likely, but they've also got to get Pat Mahomes to make some of these bad throws. And mm -hmm. he just doesn't do that, right? He's never lost by more than a score in his entire career. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's the, like the guy's freaking insane. So um, the, the fourth most likely way is. I think 
what we sort of alluded to earlier, which is the the Chiefs get out to they they start hot. You know, they don't they don't dilly dally around like they have in the past. They get out to a big lead, but what we have seen it's happened multiple times is look, the Chiefs get out to this big lead and they like teams can come back because, well, first off, they don't have a defense that has just a ton of talent all over the place. And the Niners are the fourth best passing offense and expected points added per play. In that Chiefs game from a year ago, the Niners were on the precipice of coming back and making it a one score game and Jimmy G tears his ACL. So I could see that happening. And I, could, I will go so far as to say the Chiefs, there's a way where this game works out where the Chiefs get out to this big lead. The Niners all of a sudden rally behind this situation, start putting together plays and come back and actually win this game as opposed to the Chiefs, you know, being able to kind of continue scoring um, because that has happened before. Right. It's just been situations where they I'm not going to say score too much too early, um, but the, I think that to me is the fourth kind of outcome is a Chiefs get out to a big lead. The Niners just scratch their way back and are able to um, to to push it over at the end. Well, I told you before we were on air that I wouldn't bring this player up, but in Alex Smith and Andy Reid's first playoff game with the Chiefs, the Chiefs held a 38-10 third quarter lead uh, and lost. (laughs) And and Andy Reid was very much like, you know, that was Andy Reidian, right? And then, you know, three years later, when we had the over in Tennessee, Kansas City in the playoffs, they had a 21-3 lead uh, at halftime. So it's certainly been something the Chiefs have had to endure um, you know, this was pre Patrick Mahomes, but you know, it's not something that they have, you know, not, you know, have had to deal with before. So I agree with you. I do think that that's a very plausible outcome. Um, it's a very, you know, given, you know, Reed has exercised a great deal of demons. He still has not won a Super Bowl, And so there, that's a, the extra hurdle he has to get over. Uh, for me, the fifth most likely, so this is tough because this, what's interesting about this game is I, you know, I think we both have a healthy respect for each team. And so the blowouts, I don't think are a thing, right? We both think that the, that either team is going to, um, you know, is going to persist, even if there are issues. Um, there is, I think there is a, a subset of games where it, I do think there is a subset of games where the Niners struggle offensively and, and the Chiefs tries so it's a little bit of a subset of that third one Mm -hmm. but i but it's where the niners score or fewer points um but their defense plays well enough to keep them in the game um so something of you know of the ilk of 21 17 Mm -hmm. uh something like that and either team i think could win that game um you know but since the chiefs are a little bit better offensively i think they persist but it's more of a game where all the things that we said have heard about the niners defense are true and all the things we've heard about the new chiefs defense are true and it actually has an impact on the game. And the game is close in a more traditional game goes under the total way. And it's it's not likely. I think that the probability of this falls off drastically from the other four. But that is certainly a way that this game could turn out. And all the unders that we bet hit. There's a monsoon in Miami, like a tropical storm. Shakira and J-Lo won't even come out. Tyree, Kill, gets in, Tyree Kill gets injured. Like, I, like, to me, like that's a way, you know what I mean? And yeah. then Jimmy G throws interceptions. But... In a obviously interceptions in a game like this, Jimmy G interceptions would make the game go over, I think. But if they're in the red zone or something right, like right, that, right. then then it could be a different a different story. So like that, it's a, it's like I said, it's a lot less likely than the other outcomes. But I think it's a, an outcome that can occur. Well, I like that four of the games uh, four of the outcomes that we discussed are what we've sort of talked about since this number got released, uh, which is, hey, like, there's no reason not to expect points in this game. There's no reason to think that the Niners are just going to not throw the ball. They're an incredibly efficient passing game in games where they have, you know, that Saints game, they threw the ball. Like, they had to. They threw the ball in that open possession. Um, that Vikings game, that first drive, they threw the ball, and then the Vikings, you know, clearly were not game. Um, and, and the Packers, same way. Like, they just didn't show up, and they were able to throw the ball to get the lead and then run it to salt it away. But in this game, unlikely for that to happen. Um, all right, you are coming back here. I will see you tomorrow. Um, travel safe. Bring me a beignet, maybe. I, I'll package it up for you, man. And especially considering it was a, a, a tough day for everybody. Yeah. Man. Um, but I look forward to seeing you, man. I missed you. I haven't seen you since 
what Thursday? I know it's been a long time, but but we'll we've got we'll get week. to go to Miami, have some have some fun. Our two favorite teams are in the Super Bowl. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can complain about. Nope, absolutely not. Uh, prayers up for the um, the the Bryant family, and uh, hope everyone out there uh, remembers to uh, put things in perspective. Travel safe, and I will see you uh, tomorrow. Peace, brother.